guest speaker tonight is uh, Michel Paradis. Uh, he's a leading human rights uh, lawyer and a national security law scholar, and currently teaches right now at Columbia Law in New York City. Um, he's appeared and written for such likes as the PBS NewsHour, CBS, MB MSNBC, CB, uh, 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 CNBC, C-SPAN, NPR, The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Washington Post. Wow, um, busy guy. Yes, and anyway, um, uh, he's a fellow at the Center of, of Nas uh, National Security and the National Institute for Mis Military Justice. Um, he has won several high profile cases around the globe, including some of the landmark cases to arise out of Guantanamo Bay for the, United, for the United States Department of Defense, the Military Commission Defense Organization, and so on. Um, his degree in law came from Fordham, Fordham University, and he, uh, his, uh, his doctorate came from Oxford. Um, you can't get bigger than that. He, uh, he got up very, very early this morning to, uh, to join us here. And um, anyway, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a rainy, gloomy night, and he flew all the way from New York City this morning. Let's give a huge Minnesota welcome to Michelle Paradis. You know, I, I think storytelling is quite important. Um, and uh, I'll start with the story um, of the, when I interviewed Dick Cole at the very beginning of my research of this book. Um, and uh, Dick Cole at the time was about 99 years old, um, and I went to visit him at his home in Texas, and he was such a gentleman, uh, so much more uh, alert and on top of things than I was. Um, and at one point, he just sort of casually asked, he said, you know, why would anyone want to write another book about the Doolittle Raid? Um, which, you know, at the beginning of your research and book writing process is not, the, is not a question you're really prepared to answer. Um, and um, and I had, I've thought about that. I've thought about that question a lot. Why did I write this book? Um, and there are a lot of reasons, but I think one of the most important reasons is stories. That's, that's really what, um, you know, that you've, you've created here. Uh, we, history is, the, is, a, is a story, is, is a discipline of storytelling. It's how we know who we are. It's how we know where we're going. We understand ourselves uh, and we understand our values. We understand where we've been. We understand our mistakes and our victories um, through storytelling. And, and I tried to be uh, you know, as accurate um, and as engaging as possible so that this would be a story that everyone could read and not only hopefully enjoy, um, but be inspired by and, and really you know, see yourselves in the story and see the, the great, amazing country that you're a part of. Um, and so that's why I decided to tell this story again, um, <laughs> despite many other uh, competitors. And, it's a, it's a, and part of it is a familiar story uh, to you all. Um, uh, it's the story of the Doolittle Raid, which starts, of course, with Pearl Harbor and the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, and the need by the United States to respond. And that need was felt not simply because we were angry, not simply because we were humiliated and shocked uh, by this surprise attack against a nation, by a nation whom we were in the midst of negotiating uh, terms for peace. Um, it, was a, it was a shock because we were not sure we could win this war. If you look around uh, in 19, if you look around in early 1942, what's going on? Uh, the Nazis, are advancing. Uh, the Japanese have pushed a perimeter all throughout the Pacific, uh, all throughout Asia. They're bombing Australia. And there was a need, not simply to strike back, to get revenge for what had happened at Pearl Harbor, but there was a need to show that this was a war that we were not only willing to fight, but that we were willing and capable of winning. And uh, the how to do that was almost impossible. Uh, it's easy to forget what technology was like in 1942. There had been one plane, uh, a test flight, to go from the United States to Japan. Um, it flew from the closest point to Japan in the United States to the closest point in Japan. It had to drop its wheels in order to have enough fuel to get there, and it ultimately crash landed into the side of a mountain. Um, and so the very idea of bombing Japan was impossible until the idea came, could we take army bombers off an aircraft carrier. Is that possible? And the honest answer was no, it wasn't. But they put the, the question to Jimmy Doolittle, who um, was you know, a really 
would, would be a, a major historical figure in his own right, even without the Second World War. He was a, a pioneer of aviation um, who simultaneously uh, had the sand to uh, be, to, to sort of get tickets for flying uh, illegal acrobatics over airports, but at the same time he had a PhD from MIT. And the need to figure out how to do the impossible uh, fell to Jimmy Doolittle because Jimmy Doolittle was someone who had made a career doing the impossible. He was the first American to fly all the way across the United States in a single day. And it's very easy as, you know, I, I took a flight out this morning and was picked up very, uh, very early. Um, it's very easy to forget that San Francisco and New York City weren't just a few hours away. They were a continent away. And what Lewis and Clark had, you know, taken months to do to, to map out this massive continent that is America, Jimmy Doolittle had tied together in a single day. And Jimmy Doolittle, in addition to uh, creating all sorts of instruments and studies of how to fly planes more safely, literally flew a plane blacking out his windows on the principle that it was better to fly with math than it was to fly by the seat of your pants, like you're flying a horse. Um, and, and he always did it by making the numbers add up. And so when it came time to launch the Doolittle Raid, Jimmy Doolittle was the natural person to ask because if anyone could make the numbers add up, it was him, and he did. And so uh, on April 18th, 1942, uh, after uh, a, a tumultuous uh, journey at sea, although by crossing the international date line they missed April 13th, which they all took as very good luck. <laughs> Jimmy Doolittle took, and, and a crew uh, of 79 other men, took 16 planes off the aircraft carrier USS Hornet in a squall uh, where the deck of the, of the aircraft carrier was pitching violently. You can see it here in this image pitching violently up and down. Water is casting over the deck. You can see men essentially crawling around on the deck lest they slip off and into the churning ocean. And Jimmy Doolittle and his crews, after training and making the numbers add up, after being spotted too early, so they're now going to have to bomb. After being spotted, they have to take off even earlier than expected. So not only do they have to fly even further, they have to bomb during the day when Japanese air defenses are expected to be uh, the most accurate. They take off from the USS Hornet, uh, fly six to 700 miles to Japan, uh, find, mil find their targets in Tokyo, uh, Nagoya, uh, and Yokohama, and strike Japan, strike at the heart of Japan. And as a practical matter, uh, if we're honest, the bombing of Japan was trivial. They only had a few bombs, they only hit a few places, Japan's war production was in no way uh, significantly impeded by the material damage the Doolittle Raiders had inflicted. Yet, the strategic significance of the Doolittle Raid, of a, essentially a, a minor tactical operation, the strategic of, significance of that could not be overstated. It had been part of Japanese mythology for centuries that Japan was impregnable from abroad. The last, the last enemy, the last foreign enemy that had even gotten close to invading Japan was Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan attempted to launch a flotilla across the Sea of Japan, a flotilla whose size uh, was rivaled only by the D-Day invasion. And that flotilla, Genghis Khan, the greatest warrior, the greatest conqueror probably of all time, uh, was sort of torn asunder by a freak typhoon that no one had predicted. And so in Japanese lore, this typhoon gained the name the Divine Wind, or the Kamikaze. And so Japan had this mythology that not only um, were they a special nation, a nation that went back as old as time, that they were an impregnable nation. And history had borne that out. Indeed, physics had borne that out in the context of World War II. No, they did not think it possible, for all the reasons it was impossible, to bomb them. And then they were. And it was a shock. And it was a shock that they could be attacked. It was a shock that they had underestimated the United States. And they made a number of strategic blunders as a result uh, of that surprise attack, as a result of that shock, um, to include pulling their defensive perimeter far closer to the Japanese mainland, uh, which in turn allowed the United States to ultimately island hop their way uh, into striking distance. Um, they engaged in a utterly uh, brutal and sadistic campaign 
of reprisal operations against the Chinese mainland and turned what had been a simmering but largely stable counterinsurgency uh, into a situation that Japan really was never able to recover from. Um, and I think they made another major strategic mistake um, in, um, in how they ultimately dealt with the dual literators. But before I get to that point, um, I wanted to show you this picture here, which is um, how the act, most of the Doolittle Raiders actually got away. So not only was Japan struck, not only was Japan shocked, the Americans pulled it off, Doolittle pulled it off. In fact, 64 of Doolittle's Raiders not only made it to China, they made it back to the United States. One of Doolittle's planes had to uh, ditch um, in Russia or land in Russia. It was actually the only plane to land on its wheels um, because it had run out of fuel. All the other planes, either had to uh, parachute out or crash land all, all in, uh, to the off the Chinese coast or in the in chi Chinese interior and attempt to make their way to safety. And they made their way uh, to a uh, Chinese city. Uh, I think it used to be called Chu Chao, but it's Kuju is how it's pronounced today. And I got a chance to visit that in researching uh, this book. And they held up in this cave uh, that is still there. It's largely undisturbed. The only sort of the, the most activity it currently gets are tourists like me um, and teenagers who are hiding from their parents and they go into this cave um, to, to uh, avoid adult supervision. Um, and, but what happened to this city was shocking. Uh, the Japanese uh, uh, launched, a after it was discovered that Kuju had essentially been the staging ground for Doolittle and most of the raiders escape, uh, the Japanese uh, launched a reprisal attack of 2,000 sorties against a pretty small town. Uh, the, the, the thousands were killed. Uh, the chronicles of those who survived it were that essentially it was thundering all of the time with bombs for weeks. Um, in addition, the Japanese in a punitive operation went in to destroy the airfields. And they were not content to destroy the airfields with bombs. They actually made the Chinese uh, citizens of Kuju manually go out to the airfield with picks and shovels to dig ditches into essentially concrete and hardened ground, hardened clay. Uh, Backbreaking work. Many, many were killed, actually, in the process um, because of their fury at what the Doolittle Raiders had pulled off. But Doolittle made it to safety. He ultimately is awarded the Medal of Honor uh, upon his return to the United States by uh, uh, President Roosevelt. He is one of the few people to be promoted from Lieutenant Colonel to Brigadier General overnight. Um, and, but all the while, and this is sort of one of the sort of fascinating political aspects of this story, all the while the United States is denying that it had any role in the bombing of Japan. Uh, FDR, there's a great fireside chat uh, where he basically sounds like a grandfather who's surprised by the Christmas presents uh, under the tree on Christmas Day as, as his grandchildren are running around saying, it seems that someone has bombed Japan. How undignified for the Japanese. What an amazing thing. Um, and that was a very canny move uh, for a very canny politician such as FDR. On the one hand, uh, by pretending the United States knew nothing about it, uh, reporters in Washington had a good news story to dig into. Uh, so instead of reporting on the Bataan Death March, uh, instead of reporting uh, on the uh, loss of more and more territory uh, in the march of, uh, in, in the, uh, on the Eastern Front uh, or in the Pacific. They were trying to figure out what was the story behind the Doolittle Raid. Um, but it was also important uh, to keep the United States' involvement, uh, at least initially, under wraps because eight of the Doolittle Raiders couldn't be accounted for. Uh, they, in fact, uh, were captured by the Japanese uh, in the Chinese interior. Uh, they were essentially uh, fell into the hands of Japanese allied uh, Chinese guerrillas and were soon taken into the custody of the Japanese secret police, the Kempe Tai. And the Kempe Tai did precisely what you think they might. They tortured these men. They hung them by the ceiling. They held them in solitary confinement for weeks on end, driving them mad. They deprived them of sleep. Uh, Chase Nielsen, who I write about a lot in this book, uh, was forced to kneel on the ground at one point while he was being interrogated. And his interrogators put a broom handle behind his knees and then made him kneel down with that broom handle behind his knees and then started stomping on his thighs, pulling his knee joints apart. Uh, they were waterboarded. Uh, they were subjected to humiliation. They were paraded in front of cameras. This video specifically is a Japanese propaganda film 
um, that was uh, taken of the Doolittle Raiders to show the Japanese people the, that these sort of dastardly Americans could not get away with this. And this image inside Japan becomes quite famous. It's on the front page of almost every Japanese newspaper uh, in the Pacific, um, showing this captured American. This is uh, Bobby Height, who was the um, co-pilot on the 16th plane off the deck. Uh, he had actually been the pilot on another plane and bribed his, and a plane that was actually not loaded onto the Hornet. And so in order to get into the actual action, uh, he bribed someone to get the co-pilot seat. And this is where he, uh, this is where he ended up. Um, and so one of the things that I sort of tried to delve into in this book is how the Japanese reacted to the Doolittle Raid. And in addition to torturing these men for obviously humiliating them, there was this question about, well, what do we now do with them? Right? We have these eight prisoners. And it was certainly not uncommon for the Japanese to simply execute their prisoners. And so that was my sort of starting pre presumption. Why, why weren't they just executed? Well, it turned out Japan was a fairly complicated society. And there was a debate inside of Japan, should we comply with international law? Japan had uh, been one of the leading lights, actually, of international law in the 1920s, but when it turned, sort of made its militarist turn in the 1930s, uh, that changed. But there were still rivalries where you had uh, doves, such as Foreign Minister Togo, saying, look, we need to comply with the Geneva Conventions, including with respect to the humane treatment of prisoners. We promise to do that. Uh, the if we don't do this, there are tens of thousands of Japanese citizens and Japanese American citizens currently being interned. Um, but on the other side, you had people like um, uh, uh, War Minister uh, uh, um, um, uh, Sh uh, Shimomura, uh, who was basically saying, no, we need to behead them as quickly as possible in order to send a message that Japan should not be attacked. And so this debate roiled inside of, inside of the Japanese cabinet until uh, Tojo, who was sort of the mediator of these two violent factions, decided he would do what people in these kinds of situations often do, and he consulted the lawyers. And so they reached out to the Japanese lawyers in the war ministry and with instructions saying, is there a legal way that we can execute the Doolittle Raiders? And the Japanese lawyers, this was a, an amazing document when I found this in the National Archives, the Japanese lawyers came back and said, no, obviously, you can't kill prisoners. That violates international law. And this was sent up the chain of command, and then back down the chain of command was the instruction, no, I don't think you understand. Is there a legal way to execute the Doolittle Raiders? And so what they ultimately hit upon is the idea that, okay, we're going to try them as war criminals. If we try them first as war criminals, then we can execute them. Very convenient. Problem, though, is we don't have a law prescribing war crimes in Japan. There's no law that they violated. And so the ultimate solution was that they pass an ex post facto law, the Enemy Airmen's Law of 1942, which makes it a uh, crime only punishable by death to commit atrocities against the Japanese, to indiscriminately bomb Japan. And so the Doolittle Raiders uh, were ultimately taken to a festering dungeon in Shanghai by the name of Bridge House, uh, where they were held. Dean Hallmark, uh, who was the pilot of the sixth plane off the Hornet, um, goes from about 200 pounds uh, down to about 140 pounds in a, in a, in a matter of a few weeks. Uh, he's completely listless. And they conduct this trial in Shanghai uh, with Dean Hallmark laying on the ground with flies buzzing over his head on a stretcher. And this trial, depending on who you asked, lasted anywhere from an hour to two hours. And as a lawyer, I can tell you no trial lasts an hour to two hours, certainly not a criminal trial, certainly not a murder trial. Uh, but there was a problem. How do you prove that the Doolittle Raiders committed war crimes? Well, we have the evidence, the queen of all evidence, as the Russians will say, the confessions, the confessions we got out of them by torturing them. And so with these confessions in hand, they say, here, you confess to committing atrocities against the Japanese. You are guilty, aren't you? And they were all convicted. They were all sentenced to death uh, through the intercession of Emperor Hirohito uh, for as much political reasons as anything else. The sentences against all uh, but three were commuted to life uh, with special treatment. Um, three, though, Dean Hallmark, William Farrow, and Harold Spatz, who was the youngest of the group, uh, were taken out to a golf course outside the Japanese garrison in Shanghai, uh, tied to small wooden crosses on the ground, made to kneel, and shot through the head. Their bodies were cremated 
uh, and marked uh, with false names to hide their executions. And a few months later, news breaks uh, based on Japanese intelligence uh, reporting and Japanese diplomatic statements that the Doolittle Raiders had been punished. And this sets off, uh, and, and the Roosevelt administration announces this uh, on the first anniversary of the Doolittle Raid, and it sets off a national furor. You have senators, congressmen calling for the summary execution of all Japanese prisoners. Uh, but Roosevelt takes a very different turn. And, and this is a really historically important moment that I think is both at the core of what, what interests me in this story and what really makes this story more than just a, a good yarn. Roosevelt says, no, we're not going to treat these people as barbarically as they have treated us. We're going to prosecute them as criminals. And that, in 1943, that is a radical idea, the idea that you're going to prosecute your enemy in a trial as a war criminal rather than just summarily execute them. And so the Doolittle Raiders become some of the early martyrs of the Second World War and become the impetus uh, for wanting to try Japanese war criminals and, and war criminals of the Axis more generally. Um, in the aftermath of this revelation, it's believed that all of the Doolittle Raiders had been executed. All eight of the captured Doolittle Raiders uh, had been executed. Uh, Hollywood made yet another movie about the Doolittle Raid during the war uh, called The Purple Heart, which actually stands up pretty well um, as movies go. Um, this is the, the promo reel for The Purple Heart, and it imagines, it essentially fictionalizes the imagined uh, show trial, torture, and ultimate execution of the Doolittle Raiders at the hands of the Japanese. One of the things, though, that this in addition to sort of emphasizing and highlighting the barbarism uh, of the Japanese for not only torturing these men but subjecting them to a show trial, it solidifies in the public mind that all of these men have died. Um, the, uh, there are memorials to, to them. They are, their names are, are put uh, on, on airplanes. They are treated as lost. Except in August of 1945, uh, the OSS, in the immediate aftermath of the end of the, the armistice uh, following the second atomic bombing, the OSS sends commando teams out to war, uh, uh, prisoner of war camps throughout China, uh, including uh, a prison called Feng Tai, which was essentially an old railroad station outside of Beijing. And in the course of liberating this camp, they hear a rumor that the Doolittle Raiders are there, but none of the men that they have liberated from this camp are the Doolittle Raiders. And sure enough, squirreled away in a secret prison inside of Feng Tai, Bobby Height, uh, Chase Nielsen, and uh, Jacob, De Jacob DeSager on the side um, are undernourished, uh, are near death in the case of George Barr, who was the fourth of the Doolittle Raiders. He's sitting there on the right. Um, but they're alive. And this is one of the most sort of you know, again, it's, it's easy to forget, and that's hopefully what this story will, will prevent, but it's easy to forget how much of a miracle it was that these men who everyone watched die in the Purple Heart, in fact, were alive. And not only were they alive, they had a story to tell. They had a story to tell of the real Purple Heart. And that spurred, um, in, the po in the immediate post-war period, the, the promises, the desire to fulfill the promises uh, to hold those who had mistreated them accountable. And so my story, uh, in some ways, really begins um, with and, and seeks to, to unpack this effort to find accountability for the torture and the murder of the Doolittle Raiders. And it's a really difficult problem. In some ways, almost every Japanese, certainly all the way up to Emperor Hirohito, uh, were guilty and, and could have been tried for the murder uh, and torture of the Doolittle Raiders. And it fell to two uh, ambitious young lawyers. There's Robert Dwyer uh, and John Hendren in the middle. Uh, John Hendren in Missouri, Robert Dwyer of Rochester, New York, um, who were JAG officers, uh, judge advocates, uh, military lawyers serving with the Flying Tigers in Shanghai, who basically got the file and they said, can you please um, put, uh, figure out who can we try for the murder of the Doolittle Raiders? And they looked all around. Robert Dwyer essentially travels all over Asia looking for who's responsible. And what he, he ultimately decides and he ultimately figures out is the real culprits, the real 
um, war criminals, those who are most responsible for the torture and mistreatment of the Dula Raiders, are the lawyers. And, they, and he decides that we're going to put the lawyers and the judges who put them before the show trial on trial. Because not only did that show trial launder evidence of torture, uh, it set the stage for everything that happened to them subsequently, the starvation of Robert Mader, the execution of Dean Hallmark, Harold Spatz, and William Farrow. And so it's an ambitious case. It, it was a high-profile case. The news was covering it almost every day. Um, and, but it came time, if we're going to put a trial on trial, to get, come up with defense lawyers. And no one, as you might expect, wanted to be the defense lawyers for the Japanese who were be, uh, charged with torturing and murdering the Doolittle Raiders. And so they found a pilot, uh, a pilot by the name of Edmund Bodine, who had won the Silver Star uh, for flying uh, L-5, uh, L-Birds, uh, um, sort of air, uh, um, air commando flights all throughout the Chinese interior at the, in 1945. And he did happen to go to a little bit of night school before joining the Air Force, um, but he was not a lawyer. But nevertheless, he ran with the case. He decided that it is my job, it is my duty to defend these people as I would want to be defended. And uh, Shigeru Sawada, the general, uh, who was in charge of the execution of the Doolittle Raiders, Yusei Waiko, the lawyer who organized the charges against them, and then uh, Sotajiro Tatsuta, who was on the far left, was the uh, brig commander who executed them, and then uh, Yusei Waiko, who is the uh, man sort of looking sort of askance to the side, um, was one of the judges on the court. Uh, that ultimately convicted them. Um, and in Shanghai, in 1946, a trial gets put on trial. And I often like to say, and I'll, I'll sort of conclude, close with these remarks, that the thing that was most amazing to me when I first read this story, when I first read this trial, particularly as a lawyer, is that I think it could be fairly described as the first fair trial, the first fair war crimes trial. Not simply uh, because they were quite scrupulous in, in looking to and trying to apply international law as a real kind of law. Um, but because the defense lawyers, uh, there Edmund Bodine uh, on the side, uh, the pilot, uh, and then his assistant counsel, uh, who's sitting uh, all the way at the other end, looking sheepish, because um, they really tried to put on a defense. They defended the Japanese, who were their enemies. They, they did to their enemies uh, what, they, uh, what they, their enemies had denied to the Doolittle Raiders, and that was the opportunity to make their case. And the result surprised everyone. I won't give that spoiler away in the hopes that you maybe will at least take the book out of the library and read it for yourself. Um, and, but it set a precedent. It, it set a number of precedents. It set the precedent that you can have a fair war crimes trial, that not all war crimes trials are victor's justice. And in fact, it set a precedent that is encoded in the Geneva Conventions to this day. And that is that it is unlawful to punish anyone uh, except upon the judgment of a regularly constituted court affording all the judicial guarantees recognized as, civil, uh, recognized as indispensable by civilized people. And that is the precedent of the Doolittle trial. That is the precedent of the Doolittle raid, that we can, make a, we can go from a world in which reprisals, in which the execution of a defeated enemy is treated as routine, uh, to a world in which we can judge our enemies by immutable standards, universal standards of humanity, uh, for their war crimes, for their crimes against humanity. And that's a legacy that we as the United States uh, were very much at the forefront of establishing and that the Doolittle Raid and the, Doolittle, the trial of those responsible for murdering the Doolittle Raiders um, was ultimately responsible for making a reality. And so that story is something I think everyone should know and uh, I, hope, I hope you enjoy it. As uh, Michelle alluded to, uh, it's about telling stories, and, and sir, you're a marvelous storyteller. It's, uh, thank you very, very much for coming so far to, uh, to be with us here tonight, and uh, uh, thank you for a well done and a very professional and polished presentation. Um, now we're going to move on to um, uh, something that's really possibly you don't know about, that um, in Minnesota, we had quite a connection to the Doolittle Raid. And uh, we have a gentleman here tonight that um, uh, is probably the most authoritative person that I certainly know about uh, the Minnesota connection uh, to the Doolittle Raid in regards to his employment, his early employment at Mid-Continent Airlines. Everybody remember Mid-Continent Airlines? It was a long, 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 long well, it was a, 
It wasn't that long ago, Jim. No, no. <laughs> anyway, I want to bring up to the podium uh, a, a, a gentleman. Um, he's been uh, he's been a hallmark in this community for a lot of years in terms of aviation. Um, uh, Mr. Jim Johns, who attended Washburn High School in the University of Minnesota, he spent four years in the uh, Marine Aviation Reserve, two years active duty uh, Army Aviation in Germany, and 13 total years in the Army National Guard Aviation. Um, Jim's been married to his lovely bride of 64 years and is very lucky with three uh, children, six grandchildren, one great great grandchild. Uh, He's um, built and restored over 19 World War II aircraft in his tenure. In fact, if you go over to Fleming Field, and everybody's probably familiar with Miss Mitchell, uh, the B-25, beautifully restored B-25J that's uh, owned by the Commemorative Air Force. Um, Jim owned it at one time, and uh, he'll, he'll probably tell us a story with that. Um, he was actually employed with Mid-Continent Airlines. I'll let him share that story. And uh, he owned the B-25, like I mentioned earlier, and um, uh, had the good fortune of uh, going on the air show, air show circuit, where he met uh, several of the Doolittle Raiders uh, in, in, uh, in all the years that he participated in that. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to be Vanna White up here, and I'm going to kind of run his PowerPoint presentation. Um, Jim likes to walk and talk, so we're going to bring uh, a microphone up for Jim. Hey, boys, could you bring the house lights up just a little bit? And I'll take any one you want, Jim. That's fine. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jim Johns. You're going to be seeing some pictures of the B-25s when they were in Minneapolis. I want to point out one or two things to you because I'm not going to be looking at the pictures. Number one, these are not professional pictures. While the aircraft were in Minnesota, this of course was a secret operation and no one knew what they were here for. The operation was very heavily guarded by military police over uh, from, uh, from Fort Snelling. So all the photographs that you will see were from the mechanics working on the aircraft that know that we're doing something here that someday we're going to read about. So the pictures are the brownie camera underneath the coat so that the military police wouldn't see them. Now, the thing I want to call to your attention is you will notice for January and February of 1942, when the aircraft were here, there is no snow. You will see one picture where a bunch of naval personnel are standing around Doolittle's aircraft, 02344, where they are in shirt sleeves. That picture was taken January 23rd, January 23rd 1942. The temperature that day at the airport was 43 degrees. And again, you will notice, no snow. <clears throat> okay, let's get down to business here. Uh, when Doolittle was given the, the assignment, he immediately went to the Army design people at Wright Field. What does it take to get absolutely the last mile out of a B-25? This is top secret. Get back to me as quick as you can. And in three days, they did. In essence, they said, well, you're probably not going to like what we have to say. <clears throat> because to get the last mile out of a B-25 would require the installation of a 275-gallon, 20-gauge thick fuel tank up into the bomb bay that would mean eliminating over 50% of the bomb shackles, which probably defeats the purpose of the whole thing, and then requires repositioning of the balance of them. It would require the installation of a 160-gallon rubber tank in the crawlway over the bomb bay. It would require the, it would require the removal of the rear bottom gun turret just immediately behind the bomb bay, which, by the way, represents 40% of the protection of the airplane. Removing the gun turret and, in its place, installing a 60-gallon rubber tank. They're adding about 500 gallons to the fuel capacity of the aircraft that already carries 646 gallons, 
making over 1,200 gallons of fuel in a medium bomber, where if it's hit by the wrong bullet, it will be an explosion that will be seen for 200 miles, or a flying torch that could be seen by the same distance. Now, add to that the fact that the gross weight of the airplane increases from 28 to over 31,000 pounds, which now stresses the design limits of some of the components in the airplane. And if that's not enough, with all the handles, pumps, valves, hoses, and clamps associated with this system, and then incorporating that into the regular fuel system of the B-25, it would be a plumber's nightmare. Now we have to tell you that the Army is too busy fighting a war. Something like this is best left to the airlines. And there we have to tell you that American, United, Northwest, Chicago, and Southern have already turned it down. In essence, do a little, what do I do now? They said, if you're still insistent on moving ahead with this project, Mid-Continent Airlines in Minneapolis is waiting for your call. At the time, 1942, there were two main airlines operating out of Minneapolis. Northwest, East Coast, West Coast, uh, Mid-Continent, North-South. Minneapolis, Des Moines, Kansas City, St. Louis, Tulsa, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and such. <clears throat> the Army kind of subconsciously hoped that Mid-Continent would bite on this project for three reasons. Uh, number one, we're at war, all the airline mechanics are gone. Yet Mid-Continent was the only airline on the face of this planet that required that you be a journeyman mechanic before you touch an airplane. Uh, secondly, and think about this, the idea of a bunch of brand new bombers parked in front of an airline hangar is going to raise some eyebrows. In those days, 1942, Minneapolis was still kind of off the beaten path of East Coast, West Coast, and such a scene would not attract the attention or raise the eyebrows in Minneapolis like it would in Kansas City, St. Louis, or Chicago. And finally, ironically, Mid-Continent had just completed a brand new hangar, the very last hangar on the old 34th Avenue, uh, large enough to do the job. If you recall in the old days driving down 34th Avenue, you passed the terminal building on the left, and then you passed the three Duponti hangars where the uh, troop carrying gliders were assembled, and then the very last hangar was the Mid-Continent hangar. The next day, Doolittle was in Minneapolis in his P-40 that General Arnold had given him to fly around for handling this operation. He was desperate, but he couldn't let that on. He said, I need 18 aircraft modified with the modifications that I'd mentioned. <clears throat> Thinking about it, boy, what if there's some problems? He increased it to 20 foot. Why 18? Because that's what the Navy said would fit on an aircraft carrier. But if there were any problems or any louses, he couldn't reduce that number, so he increased it to 24. I need 24 aircraft modified with these modifications that I'd spelled out. I personally only have two requirements. Number one, the aircraft, uh, the program has to be completed 30 days from the day the first aircraft arrives. And secondly, there can be no leaks. Well, the mid-continent people put their heads together. It was for the war effort. It had to be done. They signed on the dotted line. 
they immediately scoured the company for 40 of the best mechanics, engineers, and draftsmen to uh, report to Minneapolis immediately to work around the clock. Meanwhile, the McQuay Radiator Company up on West Broadway, a manufacturer of automobile rail, uh, radiators, got the nod to build the 275 a gallon steel tank for the Bombay. Uh, today, by the way, they, uh, uh, they are a manufacturer of air conditioning and heating equipment. Uh, still there, bigger now than they were then. Uh, the crawlway tank of 160 gallons and the 60 gallon tank where the bottom turret belonged was given to U.S. rubber. Why? Because U.S. rubber was involved in the new self-sealing fuel tanks. Now the problem was there was only one place in the entire United States that made self-sealing fuel tanks and that's in Indiana. So the tanks not only have to be made but then they've got to be shipped to Minneapolis and Doolittle has got 30 days for the entire complete project. On January 23rd the first B-25 arrived, flown by a Minnesotan, Vern Stinsey, and his co-pilot, Dick Cole, a 02344, the aircraft that Doolittle would end up flying on the mission. Well, when they found they were going to be cooling their heels in Minneapolis for a while, they weren't going to check in at the Naval Air Station across the field, which now was heavily engaged in uh, primary pilot training for the Navy. So they went downtown, and they found the old Dykeman Hotel. How many of you remember the Dykeman Hotel? <laughs> On the south side of West 7th Street between Nicollet and Hennepin, directly across the street from Minneapolis's premier movie theater, The Century. The 17th bombardment group up in Pendleton, Oregon, Oregon, had been siphoned for volunteers for anti-submarine patrol work where they would be operated out of uh, Columbia, South Carolina. They would fly to Columbia, South Carolina by way of Minneapolis. And when they got to Minneapolis, they found that uh, Cole and uh, Stinsey were, were living down at the Dykeman Hotel. So in the first week of February, just about all the balance of the aircraft arrived two in groups of two and three. All the crews went down to the Dykeman Hotel. When they got, when everyone was at the Dykeman Hotel, the senior officer in the group, Captain York, brought all the officers into his suite. I don't know whether it was a suite or not, but in any event, they all got together and he said, there's been a change of plan. There will be no anti-submarine work. We are now looking for volunteers for a dangerous mission that will take you out of the country for about three months. Those that volunteer will remain in Minneapolis for 30 days. Everyone volunteered. And now, uh, a couple of the Doolittle Raiders told me in, in, in casual conversation that they spent the next 30 days wandering the streets of Nicollet, Hennepin, and Marquette, all pondering on what they, had vote, uh, what they had volunteered for and how many would probably make it. Meanwhile, out at Mid-Continent, they found that by tailing one B-25 in and nosing another one in alongside with 13 mechanics per shift, a total of 39 mechanics working, they could complete one and three-quarter aircraft per 24 hours. And when the aircraft were pushed out and gasoline poured in them to make sure everything was tight, it wasn't. 
every aircraft that they pushed out leaked. Panic. That was the one requirement that Doolittle had. No leaks, because he knew there were going to be hours, many hours in those cockpits. The least they should be able to do would be to have a cigarette. <laughs> what to do? Their engineers and mechanics got together and they decided that the only way to resolve the leaks is if they take out the Bombay 275 gallon steel tank and replace it with a 225 gallon rubber tank, 50 gallons less. But that rubber tank has to be designed and manufactured in Indiana again with the others and there's time involved. Someone had to bite the bullet and call Doolittle. They did. They told him they can't resolve the leaks with a steel tank. They've got to replace the tank with a rubber tank, and it's got to be slightly smaller. Well, in essence, Doolittle said, do what you got to do. They quickly designed the rubber tank, sent it off to Indiana, and the tanks came back surprisingly fast. They reinstalled the 225 gallon tanks into the bomb bays. They pushed the aircraft out as they were completed, poured some gas in to make sure that they didn't leak, and they still leaked. They came to the conclusion that again, with all the handles, pumps, valves, hoses, and cranks associated with this system, and then marrying that system to the regular fuel system of the B-25, it was impossible to stop the leaks. They got to call Doolittle again, which they did. And they told him the bad news. He said, I'll take the aircraft as they are. And as the aircraft were completed and the crews were called, and they came out to pick up the airplanes, and the pilots climbed into the cockpit and looked at the log books to see what had been done to their airplanes. And they saw that the gross weight of their airplanes had just increased from 28 to over 31,000 pounds. Every pilot to a man was convinced of one thing. Whatever they had volunteered to do, wherever they were going, that place from which they would launch would have mile-long runways because that's what it was going to take to get their aircraft into the air. <laughs> Somebody was going to get a big surprise. Uh, this basically completes what I have to say. I just wanted to mention one thing. If there are any of you that are desperate enough to know how this was done, Ordinarily, a B-25 required about 1,500 feet at 90 miles an hour to get a 28,000-pound airplane into the air. Now we're looking at a 31,000-pound or a 32,000-pound airplane that has to get into the air in 500 feet at 50 miles per hour. And when they were told they were going to check out and do that, every pilot to a man said, Bullshit! It can't be done! <laughs> But in two weeks, they were doing it. Uh, if any of you were interested how, in how that was done, I will meet you up uh, in, the, in the lobby at the conclusion of tonight's program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johns. So now we all know if it wasn't for what happened here in Minneapolis, the raid never would have been successful. And it's an amazing story that hardly anybody really knows about. So thank you so much uh, for following the great presentation by Michelle. And uh, this is turning out to be a heck of an evening here. And uh, uh, without uh, any further ado, I, I just wanted to um, share with the audience here um, a, little, uh, a little story in, in a day I had in, in our nation's capital. Um, I was out for business and uh, I uh, had kind of done everything I needed to do, and uh, my boss just said, hey, should, you know, do whatever you want, and, uh, uh, you know, it was on a Friday, and um, all I had to do was get back home, so he said, just take the afternoon off if you want to goof around in Washington, D.C., and uh, go ahead and do so, and it was a beautiful day, and I said, 
okay, that sounds good to me. Um, so I was staying down at a hotel in Arlington. I, I made a change, talked to the, uh, to the folks. I said, can I just store my bags here? I pushed my Delta flight out to the last one that left, uh, left from Minneapolis. And uh, I went on a little walk. And what I did was I made a map of Arlington National Cemetery. And uh, if any of you have been there, it's, uh, it's a vast place, very hilly, and uh, you definitely will get your steps in. And I made a, made a map um, because I read Michelle's book and uh, in and amongst um, some very notable people. Uh, and I've been to, I've had the, the fortune or misfortune, I guess you want to call it, whatever you want to call it, and see it. Um, I've, be, I've been out to four funerals at Arlington National Cemetery. And uh, uh, what you see on television or what you see in a movie, um, it doesn't even, even compare to what it's like to, uh, to be at a funeral when you hear the crack of the rifle volley and taps. Um, it's, it's beyond words. You can't explain how incredible it is. But I went on a walk and I made a map and uh, I wanted to make sure that um, in amongst um, the Doolittle Raiders that are buried in Arlington National Cemetery, uh, I visited Ross Greening, Bill Bauer, uh, as you can see up here, Brick Holstrom, who was the uh, pilot of the number four aircraft. Um, Davy Jones, who was a gentleman, he, uh, he not only flew the mission uh, as the pilot of number five, made it out through China. Uh, he went back and was shot down in Europe and became a guest of the Germans for the entirety of the war at Stalag Lu III, an amazing, amazing man. And of course, you had to go there and see the boss. And uh, after reading Michelle's book, it really moved me a lot because um, I, uh, I just, I just, it, it just enamored in, in regards to what these gentlemen endured. And um, I wanted to share this with you. Um, that's Robert Meter, uh, who died of malnutrition and beriberi on December 11th, 1943. And this is Dean Hallmark, which Michelle mentioned, who was one of the gentlemen who was executed on October, or October 15th, 1942. And then lastly, William G. Farrow from Darlington, South Carolina, uh, who was executed as well on October 15th, 1942. Um, these three gentlemen were repatriated out of, of China and their uh, remains now rest right next to one another in Arlington. And it's, uh, it's well, I'm, I won't be bashful, um, tears were shed. It was, uh, it was quite moving. And um, in talking about this program with Don, uh, one of the other connections that we have here in Minnesota, um, how many of you uh, go out to the Wings of the North Air Show in July out at Flying Cloud? Everybody's been out there, right? And one of the, one of the great things that's happened there is the organizers have been very kind in regards to bringing uh, a lot of World War II vets, uh, some incredibly n notable people in history. And one of them um, that I think probably all of us who went out to the air show that got to enjoy, and um, he just was as, as plain as, and simple of a, of a gentleman as, as you possibly could see. Uh, he just had a, had a way about him. Uh, you just had to know him, and that was this gentleman here. How many met Dick Cole? Or had, it, or had an autograph from him, or um, had the pleasure of, of being in his company. Um, you won't meet a, a more wonderful man. And uh, Dick Cole was the last surviving Doolittle Raider. He passed away April 7th of 2019 at uh, the age of 103. And uh, I just wanted to share a little story. Um, I've, I've enjoyed a, a, a lovely career in, in the airline industry, and once in a while, um, you know, the airlines will kick you around, you know, with mergers and uh, layoffs and pay cuts and this and that and the other thing. But uh, once in a while, you get to kind of do something cool with your job. And uh, I just wanted to share this story. This is the last time that Dick Cole came to Minneapolis and uh, was part of the air show. The, the air show concluded on a Sunday. Um, we uh, made some phone calls. And just because we could, we had some connections. And Dick Cole got a police escort in a rental car. To, the, to Minneapolis International to take his flight. I'd reached out to some, some friends at Delta. Um, he was picked up at the, at the front, and he was brought, um, didn't, didn't go through security or any of that. He just kind of went along with his daughter, uh, Cindy, and uh, he was escorted down to uh, the Delta Sky Club for a private room, privately catered in the sea concourse, and uh, uh, was, was put in there before his, his flight uh, back to San Antonio was gonna happen. Um, Interestingly enough, I'm going to show a picture of this gentleman. His name is Senior Chief Ed Byers, Jr. Ed Byers uh, is a Navy SEAL, um, and 
He had 11 overseas deployments, 11, 19 combat uh, deployments, and uh, for an action on December 5th of 2012, um, it, uh, it was reviewed, and rightly so, he was presented the Medal of Honor by President Obama on February 29th of 2016, rightfully so. Ed Byers was coming into Minneapolis, and I, I contacted the local USO at the airport about Dick Cole's departure, and I said, we gotta make a big deal of this, because we just don't know if this is gonna be his last time or if he's ever gonna be able to come back to Minnesota. We gotta do this right. And they agreed, and they said, listen, we got it. And so they, uh, they found out that Ed Byers, a Medal of Honor winner, was coming into Minneapolis almost the same time that Dick Cole was leaving Minneapolis. And they told, about, told uh, Ed Byers about Dick Cole, uh, Doolittle's co-pilot, he said, gosh, he, did you think I could get a chance to meet him? <laughs> sure. So we made the arrangements, and we got him in a cart and this and that, and they ended up, um, and here's another picture of, of, uh, uh, of Ed, and uh, that's a little private thing in the Sky, in the sky Club. And... Um, he actually brought some things from his home in Washington, D.C. for Dick Cole to autograph. And I'll tell you what, here's a guy, um, uh, an incredible American hero um, that's won the Medal of Honor. And his, I swear to God, his knees were shaken because he was meeting a, a real life Doolittle Raider. He thought it was just the most wonderful thing in the world. So I went up to the gate and, um, and kind of talked to the, to the gate folks. They let me go up to the podium and, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, I just want to uh, make an announcement here. And all the passengers that were sitting in the D concourse, um, I told them the story about the Doolittle Raid and that Dick Cole is going to be boarding this aircraft and he's going to be coming in um, to join us here in a couple minutes. So um, a little while later, they brought him on the sky cart. And if you'll notice, Ed Byers, nobody asked him to do it. He just did it um, in respect to Dick Cole. He put it on. He put it on, and they came up to the, uh, to the concourse, and uh, you can see the activity. The USO had arranged um, an honor guard to uh, say goodbye to Dick Cole at the gate, and you can see the commotion, and I'll tell you, when, when the cart came around, the place absolutely went bananas, just went nuts. Um, it was like the Twins went in the World Series again. It was incredible. They, uh, the, all the folks and taking pictures and, and this and that, and they left everybody alone. Nobody came up to take selfies or whatever, but there were a few pictures that were taken, including uh, Ed Byers um, in the ROTC uh, uh, Honor Guard that, uh, that was present at the time. I mean, could you imagine um, one of the Medal of Honor winner coming up to these kids and shaking their hand? I mean, you can see the expression in their face. Um, it was a good day for them, and then even more so, then Dick Cole gets to come up and say, say thank you to everybody. So we, uh, the, they called the flight, and it happened to be, uh, at the time I worked as an, uh, an operations control center flight duty director for Compass Airlines, and it was a Compass Airlines flight. So it was my airplane, and, or one of my airplanes, and uh, I made arrangements with the crew. When they, they got on board, um, they knew that Dick Cole's favorite drink, or adult beverage, was scotch and water, no ice and they were immediately upgraded to uh, uh, seat 1A and 1B, and the captain, after he made his uh, welcome aboard, ladies and gentlemen, will be flying at such and such in the weather in San Antonio, and by the way, we have a very special guest on board, and of course, the plane went nuts, and uh, even more so, um, he did a little homework and found out, uh, Dick Cole had this, you know, probably asked to him every day, what's the secret of the long life? How did you live to be, you know, to 100 years old? And, you know, what, do, what are the, he said, well, he said, uh, what are the things that you really enjoy in life? And he said, you know, I really like good pastry. I really like something, really good pastry. So the captain took it upon himself, and he stopped in at the, uh, before he got to the airport, uh, called up and, and found out the airplane was going to be full. <laughs> and he stopped by and bought four dozen Dunkin' Donuts assortments. And so when the, when the, when the folks got on the airplane, he made the announcement that uh, before we push back, I'm going to walk through the cabin, and in honor of Dick Cole, everybody enjoy a donut. <laughs> so we, uh, we got ready to go, and uh, there's another photo of, of Dick and Ed Byers. And mind you, this is his last time in Minneapolis uh, before he passed away. So we went down to the gate, and the boys did, did a snap to attention, and uh, they, uh, they looked apart by all means. And Dick Cole, 
and I uh, escorted him, and I, uh, I mentioned to him, I said, Dick, I said, they're saluting you. He looked up and he goes, oh, oh yeah. And he returned the salute. And so he boarded the aircraft, and uh, there's the crew, and there's Dick sitting in 1A and 1B and the Compass crew. And then uh, they buttoned up the airplane. Um, I said goodbye to him, and we pushed back. I made a little phone call to uh, Minneapolis International's finest, and they brought out one of their big tanker trucks as he pushed back, and he gave a, uh, a water cannon salute to, uh, to Dick Cole. My goodness, how did that happen? <laughs> and if you, uh, if you look at this, um, you can see just about there. What else do you see up there? Uh-uh. That's called divine intervention. <laughs> You're right. And it's a beautiful thing. And uh, um, it, was, uh, it was his last time to Minneapolis, and I just wanted to share that story with you all because he was um, a gentleman of gentlemen, and he was uh, a really special part, and he dearly loved Minneapolis and, uh, and the good friends and family that we, we, uh, we gave to him. So tonight, um, we remember a great guy, um, Richard Cole, the last of the Doolittle Raiders. And I just wanted to share that story with you because that's the way we sent him out of our, out of our community. So thank you for letting me tell you that. Um, thank you. At this time, I think, it's, I think it's question and answer time, boys. Is there a backup plan to the D25? Jim, you can maybe comment on that. Was there, was there a B plan or was it, was, uh, well, um, I'll let Jim tell it, but they, uh, they looked at all the, the thing, that, the biggest thing they had to con be concerned was, was, was the wingspan of the aircraft, because it had to pass the conning tower of the aircraft carrier. And some of them, uh, well, what other, what other airplanes were considered for the raid? The, uh, the the 24 and the 26. The B-26, yeah. the Marauder. Yeah, the yeah. B-24, no way. A B-17, no way. The only the other capable uh, medium bomber was the B-26, Martin B-26 Marauder. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, were there any other uh, experiments by the Japanese in war crimes trials? I once saw a movie about a trial of British and Australian commandos for blowing up ships in a Japanese-held harbor, and where they were executed for it, uh, did the did the did this uh, encourage them to, uh, you know, go through trials like this for other people? The, the Japanese, the, yeah, they did. Um, so the uh, the Doolittle Raider trial was passed under this ex post facto law, this enemy airmen's law, um, and then in the final year of the war, um, there was a when the uh, firebombing began, the Japanese uh, decided to no longer, um, how would you say, um, take prisoners uh, with the B-29 crews. And so they uh, decided to use the, B the um, enemy airmen's law and would essentially just conduct these rapid, rapid trials after interrogating any captured B-29 flyer um, and then execute them. And, and there were, in fact, um, it's a bit of a coda in the epilogue of the book, um, but uh, Bodine, uh, Edmund Bodine, the defense lawyer for the Japanese, and uh, Robert Dwyer uh, square off again later that summer uh, uh, in the tr basically putting uh, Japanese, uh, more Japanese uh, army officers on trial for conducting a trial of one of the, for, for executing, in essence, one of these B-29 pilots. Good question. Uh, Don. Uh, one, one thing that, uh, if you recall the story, when they went to capture Tojo, he committed suicide by putting a gun next tried to Tried to commit suicide. Tried to yeah, commit yeah. suicide. But uh, uh, someone that many people in the audience may know, a lady by the name of Catherine Kirsten, her father was a doctor from Iowa. And if I would have thought about it, I would have asked her to tell her dad's story. But her father from, the doctor from Iowa was the doctor to keep him alive so he could be tried, so he could be executed. That's right. And they actually gave him a, a blood transfusion of American GI's blood um, to keep him alive. And it actually ended up making, uh, certainly amongst sort of the sort of fascist clique inside of Japan, uh, they found this to be sort of probably an even bigger disgrace than him having failed to successfully execute himself because they started calling him a, um, 
essentially a mongrel, like the Japanese word for a mongrel, uh, which was like a deep insult uh, to, to that sort of political faction. Yeah, what was the uh, defense argument used to defend the Japanese in the trial? So, uh, it, yeah, it was, a, it was about the, as controversial an argument as you could possibly make in 1946, uh, but they basically argued the Doolittle Raiders were guilty of a war trial and that the, uh, the Japanese were right to prosecute them. And so they had, they, again, you could have, the, um, I, I try to relay the scene as best as I can uh, from the records and the transcripts and the accounts that I was able to put together. Uh, but when, the, um, when Ed Bodine basically stands up and makes this argument, you could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> it was like a hand grenade went off, uh, and the uh, prosecutor in the case basically jumps up and objects and says, you can't make such scandalous arguments in courtroom, in, in this courtroom. Um, and kind of getting to the point that I tried to make in, uh, in my presentation about being, this being the first fair trial, uh, fair war crimes trial, um, the uh, presiding officer, who was an Air Force uh, uh, pilot, um, also not a lawyer, but he was essentially the chief judge, if you want to think about him that way. Um, he was like, nope, the defense is the defense. C proceed, counsel. Uh, and they basically let them make this defense. It was, it was a really remarkable, remarkable moment. Yeah. There you go. Uh, my wife's father was a bomber pilot, pilot in 1943, 44, 45 out of North Africa, and he used to always say to her, he feared being under the direction of the supervision of his division to doodle a little because doodle's policy was to fly low and slow, whereas he preferred to be fly high and fast. Is, is there any accuracy or truth to that? Uh, so in North Africa, I'm not 100 percent sure because I haven't I haven't studied those operations. But uh, that's exactly how the Doolittle raid uh, was conducted. The um, they basically flew at about 500 feet all the way to their targets. Uh, that was done um, for a variety of reasons, not the least just you know evasion. Um, and then when they came upon their targets, I think they pulled up to about a thousand feet so that they wouldn't have too much blowback from the uh, the bombs they were dropping. So yes, they were they were flying low and slow to conserve fuel and uh, and also have a little more accuracy. Uh, in terms of the navigation uh, over over um, Japan. Uh, Michelle, did Edmund Bodine face any animosity stateside after mm. these trials? Was Good he question. a pariah to the public or something? <laughs> you bet. <laughs> he, he certainly got he certainly got some hate mail, um, and um, it was. Um, but it, but it blew over. To be perfectly honest with you, um, you know, he he was uh, an intelligence officer subsequently uh, in China. Uh, what, during the U.S. mission in China uh, until 1947, um, and um, and yeah, went on. Ultimately, did go to law school. That was kind of his uh, um, his, his sort of I think reclaiming uh, his sort of a certain uh, demerit that people I think thought about uh, um, his 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 resume at least when he was trying these cases. Um, and one of the things I didn't get to talk about in my presentation, but I hope is one of the more interesting parts of the story, is. Um, he actually was the winner of a love triangle. Um, so the um, uh, Robert Dwyer, who, who was the chief prosecutor, um, fell in love with this white Russian uh, concierge at the, the bachelor's quarters, which is this hotel in Shanghai that I actually got to stay in when I was in Shanghai uh, to do some writing called the Broadway Mansions. And she was, um, she was quite beautiful. She, uh, was. she was absolutely objectively yeah. beautiful by any standard. Um, and, and very charming and witty and highly educated, spoke a number of languages. Um, and so Dwyer naturally falls in love with her as almost every man you know, <laughs> with the, in the Air Force who was stationed in Broadway mansions did. Uh, and Bodine fell in love with her too. And so while they are duking it out in court, <laughs> they, they are duking out at night uh, for the affections of Elisabetta, um, Elisabetta Snigursky. Um, and uh, I won't spoil it and tell you who wins, but one of them wins. So. <laughs> By the book, that's By the right. Books, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another question? Any other questions? Okay. Oh, at least you made, did make me walk. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is for Jim. Uh, Jim, uh, how, I mean, how hard is it to fly a B-25 or, or is it really a wonderful plane to handle? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I bring that up because uh, other bomber pilots I've been familiar with and talked about, uh, they really didn't like flying like the B-24. That was a tough plane to fly. So what, what, what's the B-25 like? Uh, I think the airplane 
flies just like any other airplane. The only thing that really struck me when I first looked at the manual was that on the, when the airplane is on the ground, I couldn't turn the nose wheel either way, according to the manual, more than 15 degrees, which means you don't make very sharp turns with the airplane. Right. I kept, couldn't believe that. That's over only a 30 degree radius that you can turn the airplane. And uh, that's not very impressive. <laughs> but it was, it was a, it was a pretty, pretty forgiving airplane, let's call it. Well, yeah, you know, I don't have a whole bunch of time in a B-25 like, like I do a, f a few of the others. But uh, yeah, the airplane was fun to fly. Uh, <clears throat> if, if I've got a second just to tell you Take a story. Take all your time. When I was working on the aircraft at the airport, I'd go out there Wednesday nights and Saturdays, and all day Saturday. And I noticed after a couple times of going out there working on the aircraft that there was always a little puppy that used to come around. He was always there on Wednesdays and always there on Saturdays. So when I'd go up to Country Kitchen for lunch, I'd bring him back a little something to eat. So I think he got used to that. And whenever I was at the airport, he was at the airport. Well, the time was coming that I had to make a, 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 a trip with the aircraft, a ferry trip. So I applied for a ferry permit. And uh, I thought, you know, what would be nicer than to take this little dog along. So I knew in advance before I went to the airport that I was gonna put him on the airplane, he'd be there. So I took a pillow and a blanket and I put the pillow and the blanket up in the nose of the airplane. And I picked him up and I put him in the nose, closed the hatch and we started up and we went out and uh, I don't remember what the purpose of the flight was, but in any event, it was about 20, 20 minutes at the very most. We came back and landed <clears throat> I opened up the hatch and grabbed the dog and set him out, and that guy took off. <laughs> I have never, I have never seen, no matter what size, I have never seen a dog run as fast as that one did. And straight as an arrow, and you know, after a year and a half of his always being there when I was there, I never saw him again. <laughs> Say, so, Jim, also share, uh when, when, uh, when you started in 1952, I, I'm going I'm to kind of show your age, if we will, um, you went to Mid-Continent, and there were still several architectural drawings and plans and, and notes and this and that on the conversion of all the Doolittle Raider B-25s that were still there, right? Uh, yes. Now, there were no blueprints of anything that they did. There were just eight by 10 sheets of paper of what was done at each connection and how that would be done. The only blueprint that ever existed was a blueprint that, <coughs> excuse me, McVeigh had made of the 275 gallon tank. And over the years, some collectors that worked at McVeigh walked off with that. So today, the only known drawings, if there are any, uh, were inherited by Braniff when Braniff took over Midcontinent in 1953 and then went to the Braniff Museum down in Dallas. But nothing around here exists anymore. Right, right. very good. Any other questions? Yeah, for Sir? Jim, for Jim um, you mentioned you'd talk about it later, but maybe briefly, how did they get those overgross aircraft off the deck? How did they get the, when, when they, uh, they, they left Minneapolis with all the, all the conversions and the extra tanks and so forth, and they really started getting into the training down in Florida and South Carolina, uh, just very briefly, how did they get those airplanes off the ground in roughly 400 feet and maybe a oh, small well, change? Uh, I don't want to take everyone's time on that because it might be boring for people that are not into that sort of thing, but I will do a complete demonstration of how it was done up in the lobby after the program today, so we're not taking any, any uh, extra time. Fair enough. I'll do it out in the, up in the lobby right after the program. All right. One more question? Anybody? One last question. Okay. I guess that, that takes care of that. Um, well, listen, it's been uh, another, another wonderful evening, and uh, um, <laughs> I'll leave you with this. 
I, uh, I got kind of done with the day, and I, uh, I work a lot from home. And I went upstairs and uh, was just kind of getting things organized for dinner, and, and I was going to turn on the, on the uh, television just to warm up to the news. And, oh, hey, great, awesome. I love that show. Jeopardy's on. So I watched Jeopardy, and I was getting fixing dinner and doing my thing and so forth. And all of a sudden, the category was World War II. I'm like, oh, hey, so I'm going to pay attention to this. And it was World War II for 600. And the question, or the, I'm sorry, the answer that came back was, this capital city was bombed by Jimmy Doolittle in a, in a famous raid in April of 1942. Ding! Someone goes, what is Berlin? Nope, sorry, uh, that's incorrect. Ding! What is Rome? <laughs> and, the, and the third guy didn't know the answer, and, and uh, he, they finally said, it's, uh, it's Tokyo, and I said, this is the end of, of humanity right now. <laughs> it's, it's over with. It's totally over with. Anyway, uh, I know this crowd um, uh, has been uh, enormously educated by, by Michelle and by Jim tonight, and uh, I ask you next Monday, on the 18th, um, let's remember our friend Dick Cole and all the other 79 Raiders that no longer with us. Um, uh, America's finest, by by all means, America's finest. So thank you so much for joining us, Don. Welcome back, sir. Thank you, everyone. We're going to bring Michelle upstairs. I'm telling you, this is the best 20 bucks you'll spend. Um, grab this book and go for the ride. It's it's amazing. So thank you again, everybody. Drive safe. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.